All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to raise the awareness of trauma and to support and inspire new trauma therapists just starting out on the trauma-informed journey. I do that with my membership community, Trauma Therapist 2.0, my online courses and workshops, and the Trauma Therapist newsletter. If you're a therapist of any kind and you work with individuals who've been impacted by trauma, I invite you to head on over to my website at the Trauma Therapist project.com. That's the trauma therapist project.com. All right, let's get started. All right, Virginia. Um, are you ready? And your last name is pronounced Cruz. You got it. Okay. Like the ship. Okay. <laughs> okay. You ready to do it? I think so. Thank you so much. All right. All right. So here we go. So five, mm -hmm. four, three, two, and one. All right, folks, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am thrilled to have as my guest today, Virginia Cruz. Virginia, welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So Virginia is a soldier turned therapist. She's a former active duty armor soldier, a master level licensed professional counselor and national certified counselor specializing in military issues and combat related trauma. She's not the typical quote, you can do it therapist. Rather, she's been in the trenches and she speaks from a place most other therapists have never been. Her passion comes through loud and clear. And she knows that PTSD is a killer and that dissolving the stigma around mental health and treatment saves lives. Virginia, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a thrill to be here. You're welcome. Thank you so much. So listen, before we get going, share with our mm -hmm. listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Sure. I think uh, I think I would probably best classify myself as a Massachusetts girl. Grew up on the South Shore of Massachusetts, and now I live on the South Texas border. Uh, so I live on the the South Texas Mexico border in a little oh, wow. town called McAllen. Wow. Okay. Cool. So very interesting. Your bio is very interesting. We're going to get into that. I didn't even know. Um, so sort of the certifications specializing in military issues and combat related trauma. Very cool. We'll get into that. All right, let's go. So how the heck, first of all, did you get into the, into the military? Share with us that story. Well, you know, I think like a lot of folks, you know, I didn't enlist in the military because I was trying to decide between my gap year, you know, do I do it in Bruges or in Paris? You know, I, I joined the military because I didn't really have a lot of other opportunities. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I had, I had for the most part, a really a good, you know, it, it was good till it wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, as most things are. And uh, so when I was in the military, I'm, I'm an Arabic speaker and the army sent me to, to school to learn Arabic. And then I became an army interrogator. Wow. Yeah. A very, very interesting kind of a one-off background. And um uh, and then later on, um, had a lot of problems that, that came to that. As you can imagine, I was pretty busy in the beginning of the war cycle, uh, just by virtue of the skill set. Mm -hmm. And so after my third deployment, I was I wasn't doing I wasn't doing well. Mm -hmm. um, I was drinking a lot. I was mm -hmm. chronically suicidal. Okay, I wait, was, hold on. Yeah. I want to interrupt you and slow things down a little bit. Of course. Because this sounds really interesting to me. First of all, the, looking at you, you're the last person I would pick out of a line and say mm -hmm. she's an interrogator. And maybe that's why they did that. I don't know. But what was that? I mean, how did you take this on? First of all, being in the military and mm -hmm being an interrogator how how did that sit with you how did it, how did you deal with that i think as a younger person um you know and and i enlisted in 97 um so you know that's longer ago you know a lot of your listeners are you know not that old um but back in 1997 it was really exciting for me this was an opportunity for me to go to college uh further my education really enrich myself in an academic environment in which I didn't have to work by going mm -hmm. to school for my language. Um, so I, I got to go to the Presidio of Monterey in California for two years and sit at the feet of these incredible professors and learn Arabic. Wow. Um, the interrogation school, very difficult. Um, I ended up scoring really high on my entrance exams. 
Uh, there was a, a bonus that came along with it. It was very, I very fell into it. Um, and then later, you know, and, and I, you know, I sat at the feet, my, my professors and the folks who, you know, the teachers who taught me, these were, you know, Vietnam era interrogators. They were wow. just incredible. And the interrogator course was, was very difficult. There was a, a real stress on ethics on what mm. we could and couldn't do. Um, that was before the current war cycle kicked off. Mm -hmm. And so when it did, um, I ended up deploying, uh, like many folks did, with the, with the Army Reserve and ended up being one of the only folks in country who could speak Arabic. Wow. Uh, yeah. I had just that alone, that whole thing just sounds so intense. Yeah. It's been something, um, you know, it, I'm glad you said that. It's you know, that my past and, and coming to terms with that is is something that I really struggled with personally mm -hmm. because I, I do get to hide in plain sight. No one is going, no one's going to be like, you know what? I bet she speaks Arabic. That's, <laughs> that's, that's not a thing. No. No. Um, you know, I don't, I hope I don't come off as, as an interrogator to some folks, although I think you'd be surprised how analogous the skill sets are between being an interrogator and being a, a mental health therapist, right, you know, right. just kind of that, that professional question asking. Um, but, you know, as we all know, kind of after the fact, um, things got really hairy and really unethical really fast. I mean, we've all read the Hoffman report. We've all you know, kind of see, you know, we've seen the pictures from places like Abu Ghraib, we've heard about Guantanamo. And to have been kind of in the cut when that was going on, and the aftermath of that, and the incredible, really shame and guilt that I carried mm. of being, you know, uh, being a part of that. And, mm. you know, it, it very difficult and and a huge part of my own work that I'm very thankful I've I've had the opportunity to do and especially through group therapy. Uh, I'm part of a, a fairly intensive uh, therapy group mm. um, for for therapists. Uh, it's an online uh, process group or rather you know training group I should say. Um, that's run by Heim Weinberg out of the Sacramento Center for Psychotherapy. And he mm. is wonderful. What What's his name? Heim Weinberg. So H-A-I-M-W-E-I-N-B okay. as in Bravo, I think E-R-G, but I could be getting that wrong. I okay. get a lot of things wrong. Um, just brilliant. And so I've been part of his process group. Mm. Um, and it's, it's other, it's, it's for therapists. Um, and he is a, he is a master clinician and a master mm. group group therapist, and so I've been part of that for about the last five years. Wow! And um, you know, really working what it, for me personally, it's been the most integral part of my own trauma processing. I had done um, a lot of work individually. A lot mm -hmm. of work one-on-one, -on -one. Mm -hmm. but for me personally, it was that interpersonal piece um, that, you know, I needed to be, to ask and, and have answered the question, you know, can I, can I be my truest self? Can I be authentic in terms of who I am now and my past and how that informs who I am now? And can I still, can I be fully known and still be loved and honored and respected and valued by people who I love and honor and respect and value. Is that possible? And th that was the piece in my own process that I was really missing. And, you know, in terms of processing my own trauma experience mm. from, from military and deployments and, and, and. And so for me, group therapy was that key Okay. This is to me fascinating. I want to go back if I may, of course, Virginia, and ask you when you were in the midst of this, uh, how, you know, you talked about Apple grave and everything. 
how did this sit with you? I mean, were you aware of what was going on with you? Was anything going on with you at that time? Were you, were you, or were you like, man, this, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't do this, or this is not sitting well with me. That's a great question. Um, I would say for my first two deployments, um, no, it, you know, it was uh, kind of flying by. It, it, there's this expression, you know, building the airplane as you're flying it. Mm-hmm. And um, and that's what we were doing for the most part. And I had a third deployment that was, it, it did me in. It was, it was not okay. Mm-hmm. It was not okay. I think the word that I would use is phantasmagoric. It was, um, it was not okay. I was already, um, at that point, I was already very, very sick, I think, mm-hmm. um, with my own symptomology, with my own PTSD. And, um, and that was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Um, it was, you know, kind of a back to back to back deployment. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, that was the one that I was like, oof, you know what, I, this is not, this is not okay. And were you sitting alone with those symptoms? Very much so. Um, Sitting alone with those symptoms, but also very much needing to perform and having, putting a lot of pressure, you know, the avoidance is a beautiful thing, isn't it? (laughs) You know, it, it really helps us till it doesn't, or at least it helped me. And so I did, I had to sit with a lot of those. Uh, this was back in 2008 when we, at least in, on the military side of the house and in DOD, Department of Defense, we, I, you know, I, I wasn't talking about PTSD. I didn't know what was wrong with me, mm-hmm. um, but I knew there was something wrong with me. I knew oh, there was something wow. very deeply wrong with me. I was, I was very, just chronically suicidal. Um, one, you know, look, you know, it, and, but with a, with a very, um, very service minded in retrospect, you know, you know, if I die, it would be the best thing for my unit. It would be the best thing for my family. You know, they wouldn't have to have a crazy person among them. I was drinking a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I was blowing up my really great marriage, you know, torpedoing my beautiful friendships, um, not doing well at work. I was, I was very, very sick and I was having, I finally got to a point where I had an incident at work in which I kind of snapped out at someone. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of it, it's for me, it's kind of that whole period of time is sort of a brownout. Um, I, it's, you know, I, there are just bits and pieces that I remember. It's almost like it's, it's, it's very strange to look back on. It's like it's happened to someone else. And at that time, I was kind of voluntold, as we say, to go to mental health and go voluntold. talk to someone. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, I was invited to go talk to mental health, voluntold. And I was, I remember at the time, I lived in Europe at the time, and I was really thankful because I knew there was something wrong with me. I didn't know what it was. Were you talking I, to anyone, any colleagues at, at the time about this? Oh, gosh, no. And that's because of the culture, military culture, or, or why? I think that was because of my own fear. So I was experiencing a lot of paranoia, uh, hallucinations, you know, smelling things that are burning when I'm you know, sitting in my living room, um, you know, hearing gunshots when there aren't any. I had I had this very intense fear uh, that somehow I was going to be found out and be found out as crazy, mm-hmm. and lose my job, my security clearance, my life. Um, I was it was my own fear I think that went into that, and so I was very much sitting with that on my own. And so when I had the chance to go to mental health, I was, I was excited um, and very, you know, I got to sit down with a, with, with a military um, mental health professional, a psychiatrist, um, a Fulberg colonel. So this is a very, you know, a high ranking field grade officer, um, you know, just to add to that, 
power mm-hmm. differential mm-hmm. and what we in the army would call a slick sleeve, meaning that they don't have a combat patch on one of their arms. So they hadn't deployed to an environment. Mm-hmm. And I was, I, I was so sick and I poured my heart out. I, I mean, it was from what I remember again, that brown out period, very ugly. Um, And I just, I let everything out. And it was the first time I had ever talked with anybody about what I was experiencing. And I was so thankful because my expectation was that I was going to, you know, very, very militant that we're going to come up with courses of action, pick one, and then just go on in the matrix. Uh, And at the end of the 50 minutes of my hour, uh, the Colonel looked at me and he said, Virginia, I can tell that you are really hurting right now and I want to help, but I can't, if you don't choose to be honest with me, I was really perplexed by that. And I asked for some clarification and he said, we all know women don't serve in combat. And it was the kick while I was down. Um, because it, this was after my third deployment, he, he diagnosed me with a personality disorder. I was sent back to my unit with the, yeah, I'd really like to help Virginia, but I can't because. And uh, it, it was, I, I was already pretty bad before that experience um, in terms of my own symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, it, it it's hard to describe the the betrayal that I felt at that time, um, the suicidality I felt at that time. It was not just being betrayed by a mental health professional. Um, it was the fact that it was done by someone in uniform. Uh, it, and the fish rots from the head. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, when I went back to work, everyone had known. You know, there are no secrets in a military unit. And, uh, and folks, you know, it, it was, yeah, it was tough. Mm. I was, it it was, I I felt really dismissed, uh, belittled, condescended, Uh, you know, I, and, and I was already, I think it's worth, you know, I, I think I've said it already too many times maybe, but I was very, very sick. And we don't know when our, that our judgments impaired, when our judgments impaired. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was not okay. And I remember thinking to myself afterwards, uh, among empty wine bottles and a lot of tears. And I thought to myself, if I don't figure this out, I don't understand what is going on with me. I'm, I'm going to die. Like, this is no shit going to kill me. Either, either my brain is going to kill me from the inside out, or more likely, I will kill myself. But this is this is a life or death situation here, and I need to do something. I need to figure this out. And this this was in the wake of that episode with that colonel. Yeah, right after. Wow. And um, so I did what I knew how to do, and that was go to school. And so I went to graduate school. And I started studying professional counseling. And were you out of the military at this point? Uh, still a reservist. Oh, so, okay. So still kind of, kind of this lingering part timer. It's like okay. having a, like having a, a like a, like a, an ex spouse who's just kind of always in the background nagging you um, for child support or something. But it's, um, yeah. I, so I, I started studying uh, using my GI Bill to go to school. And one of the first gigs that I got after I was licensed was I started teaching at an inpatient uh, psychiatric facility for, uh, for active duty service members, so across the board, um, who were struggling with you know, kind of co-occurring PTSD and mostly substance use or alcohol use, really, mm-hmm. for the most part. And uh, my job was to teach PTSD kind of to do the psych ed piece. And um, <laughs> I used to have a, a non-commissioned officer for my first deployment who used to always say, Cruz, are you picking up what I'm putting down? And, and I, re- I just that, I love that expression. And as I was teaching, 
um, these, you know, again, very, you know, very vulnerable, very sick folks who I could, could just relate to so much. Um, I saw the eyes glaze over and, you know, as we're talking about the amygdala and the brain and, <laughs> and they're just like, Oh, like seriously, girl, really? And, um, and I said, you know what? Um, it's time to scrap this. And so I created my own curriculum and, and I thought, you know, and it was very based on, on my own healing journey. I said to myself, what is it that I wish I had known 10 years ago? What is it that I wish I had known? And, uh, what I really needed to know was, you know, what is trauma? You know, the things that you go over on this podcast all the time you know, what are my courses of action? What are, what's my treatment options? How do I choose one? How do, how do I get my family on board? How do I talk to my workplace about this? How do I talk to my chain of command Mm -hmm. and how do I keep from relapsing? So my, my thoughts were very pragmatic. Uh, and, and when I was looking for teaching materials, I was looking for something that was a clinician to English translation you know, how can, you know, and, and your brother's a Navy SEAL, so I know you know this. It's our service members are unbelievably intelligent. You know, we teach 18 year olds how to fix helicopters and fighter jets, and we can absolutely teach them what PTSD is and what mm-hmm. it isn't and how, how to recover from that. You know, that's a lot easier than learning how to, you know, drive a tank or fly a drone or speak Arabic even. Mm -hmm. Um, And so my passion really came in, you know, how can I take all this clinical jargon and break that down in a way so that it's not me as the, you know, the high and mighty, you know, super important clinician, um, but how can, you know, make it more of a love letter? Mm -hmm. How can I lead with love, my love, you know, how can I say, you know what, without, you know, delving into too much self-disclosure, because it wouldn't be appropriate in a teaching environment, but to say, you know, from one soldier to another, from me to you, this is in your language and our shared vernacular, this is, this is what's going on. This is what you're very likely experiencing. Mm-hmm. And to start this, this very aggressively authentic conversation, and it, it needed to be ag- aggressive because of my time constraint. I only had, you know, 28 days, mm-hmm. you know, as we do inpatient um, before their insurance ran out and I never get to see them again. Um, but to, to take a bunch of information, compact it, and very uh, force feed that, you know, with a lot of love and a lot of compassion mm-hmm. and talk about the things that we don't very often talk about when it comes to military trauma, mm-hmm. talking about war crimes, talking about um, institutional betrayal, about leadership betrayal. So all to- of that stuff was you. Correct. You shifted the curriculum around. I bit. did. And, and from that, I created the soldier's guide to PTSD. Oh my God. And um, so that that's my book. <laughs> and, uh, and you, I think we're giving your, your listeners a free audio copy of that book. And don't worry for your listeners. I'm not the person who reads it. It's Kelly Taker. She's brilliant. Um, but yeah, this this book came out of it, and our workbook and our PTSD recovery series came from that. You know, it it wasn't just about recog- like saying, "Wow, you know, here, you know, here's here's a problem." But how can I take what I have learned mm-hmm. and and really pay it forward? Um, because there's one of me, but I can, I, you know, I've been able to, you know, talk about the book with folks like you get the book out and, and talk about suicide, talk about, you know, what do we do when there's a suicide in the unit? How do we talk to our loved ones about PTSD treatment? How do we, how do we talk about things that we wish we had done in Mm -hmm. war, things that we should have known? Um, How do we talk about moral injury? How do we talk about 
you know, how do we balance the, the death of a loved one, you know, someone closer than a brother, you know, losing, losing someone on the battlefield? How do we, how do we square that with, you know, thank you for your service and, and heroism meant that kind of that deeper, for me at least, that deeper level of, you know, can that answering that question, can I be fully known? Can I, can I live my truth and still be loved and honored and respected and valued? And what a privilege to be on that journey with clients and to share my experience and strength and hope with, with others to let folks know that, you know what, it's okay. Mm -hmm. This isn't, this isn't a, this isn't a 12 to 15 session path for everyone. This doesn't have to be, you know, the same thing, but that there, that there is a way to heal from this, that we absolutely can heal from this and grow from this. Um, and, and that we can be fully known and that the fear of the, the fear that comes with this journey, I think is pretty normal and it's okay. When you shifted that curriculum, a couple of questions here, what shifted in you, number one, and did you, what was your experience teaching this to the, to the, the people you were teaching it to? That's a great question. It shifted into, uh, for me teaching kind of, okay, here's the brain science and, and which is all very legitimate. I mean, let's, but being able to shift that into my own words to, to get the, you know, my, I'm, I'm very research driven. So being able to share in you know, like Zimbardo with, you know, and that sort of research with my, with these students, mm -hmm. um, very powerful. Um, being able to talk about, you know, even, even topics, like I used to teach a, a, a seminar, it was called um, psychopaths, narcissists, and assholes and how they affect us. And which is, which was, um, which was, you know, really kind of a fun title, but all very based in, in research mm -hmm. and, and being able to say, okay, because most of my folks were going back to an active duty military unit. And so a lot of them had the question, how do I, you know, when I go back to my military unit after having been here for 28 days, do I, you know, am, are we going to ignore the elephant in the room? Am I just going to pretend that I was off on, you know, like at a spa vacation, or am I going to control the narrative and take a part of this? How do I deal with people in my chain of command or maybe an in-law or maybe someone, a boss, someone who's not particularly on my side. Mm -hmm. How do I talk to them about what I was experiencing in my healing journey going forward? Because we need that social support. We, we need this, or, you know, we need support from the people who love and care about us. But unless we are independently wealthy, most of us, after having some sort of mental health crises, we have to go back to work. And we're faced with this impossible task of how do we talk, like how, how, how do I talk to HR mm -hmm. about needing to take time off twice a week to go to therapy? How do I talk to my boss who thinks that maybe I'm faking it? Um, you know, how do I talk to someone who maybe looks at me and says, well, she was never in the army. There's no way she speaks Arabic. You know, how... It, you know, how do we, how do we talk to people who maybe don't support us about and get that support? And, um, and thankfully, thankfully, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's so much great psychology and great data, um, you know, whether, you know, whether we're looking at, you know, the aspects of narrative therapy, or we're looking at, uh, you know, the Rosenthal effect, uh, you know, we can just take all of these wonderful, uh, you know, seemingly disparate concepts. And I was able to pluck them out and mm -hmm. put them into a curriculum and say, okay, here's, 
you know, very pragmatic, you know, what is our course of action? How do we choose our course of action? Then what? And then what do we do after? And here's the sites to support it. What would you say from your perspective now to your younger self when you first started experiencing your symptoms? I would encourage her to find support, to find support, to talk with others, to connect with others, even if it was just one other person. I, in my own journey, I really, I thought that I had to do, I'd be alone and unafraid, you know, six feet tall and bulletproof, which I'm neither. Um, but I, I wish that I, and I understand why I didn't. I understand why I didn't. And I certainly don't look back in blame or shame for this. Mm-hmm. But one thing I wish that I had done with my younger self was um, reach out to others and, and find healthier coping skills. Uh, for me personally, I jumped into a bottle. I started drinking a lot. And just like any other coping mechanism, it works until it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And um, and when it didn't, it was a real problem. So that's what I'd want my younger self mm. to know. Let me just remind everyone, I'm speaking with Virginia Cruz. Virginia, what's the, uh, this is, I mean, first of all, thank you for sharing this, in your story. Uh, it's so intense. And it, it's I mean, the stigma, right? I mean, we brought, you mentioned that in, in your bio, how powerful that is. And, and would you, how, how would you describe the stigma around mental health currently within the military? I was just thinking about this this morning. So I, I appreciate you asking. It's, uh, you know, I, I am no longer working for the most part with active duty folks. Um, and something that I've been thinking about a lot lately is, you know, how do, how do, I was just talking to a client yesterday, for example, also an Arabic speaker and also kind of a similar background to mine, um, but certainly not same. And, um, and he is struggling he's struggling full stop and his frustration in saying, you know, I did, you know, just, just a couple months ago, I was, I was in this very intense mission, you know, in which the weight of the world was on my shoulders. And now I'm having a meltdown in the Walmart parking lot because I can't find my car. And and not feeling believed. I think that was the one thing that that really he talked about that really, it, it really resonated with me. As they said, you know, I've got this, this experience. And I feel like when I share it to people, they're like, like, oh, yeah, like, that's nice. Sure. Mm-hmm. And um, what a different world to come from, you know, this, this very it, almost like a, like a, like a horror movie set and then to come to, you know, to a very different world and his struggle to find, to find services while he is still very sick. I think that is, that's really tough, you know, for, for, for anyone who's a trauma survivor, you know, once we realize that I like, Oh crap, I really need help. Mm-hmm we are still really not okay. And so the idea, or at least I was, and I'll just speak for myself, I wasn't okay. And so the idea of, okay, now I have to call my health insurance and now I have to find a provider and now I have to uh, meet my deductible and interview a provider and ask all these questions. And I am not ready to talk about being trafficked, being raped, being abused, being 
beaten, being in an accident, all of the, my childhood sexual assault, my, you know, being bullied. Um, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. I know I need to, and to even get to that point, there are so many hurdles right. and there, you know, military folks who get out, uh, often deal with the Department of Veterans Affairs, which is a bureaucracy in and of itself. Um, and, it, it, you know, as our health insurance, you know, in the U.S. And, and so it's, you know, it's difficult to, you know, even when we know we need help, you know, like I, when I when I got volunteered to go to mental health, I knew I needed help. But then I did not, I, I mean, that was a licensed psychiatrist. It's a licensed mental health professional. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of the soldier's guide to PTSD um, is a chapter called what PTSD isn't yeah, at rumors. Mm -hmm. And the rumor mill about PTSD within military communities, uh, from what I've experienced is really powerful. And I wish that I could say that these were just rumors that I heard from other soldiers, other veterans, but these are rumors that I've heard from other clinicians, from other licensed mental health professor professionals, some of them who work as trauma therapists, supposedly. Um, you know, things like you'll you'll never recover, you know, PTSD, there's no cure. Mm -hmm. Like forget recovery, you're done. Um or that PTSD is only for military. It's only for folks who were in combat and people feeling like they don't quote unquote deserve to have PTSD. Um, and, and these are golly, you know, and, you know, I mean, and we know that now as clinicians, right. but I'm trying, you know, I, you know, I go back and I and I, I look at my own experience about talking with that colonel. What a pivotal time that was for me. And that could have gone very poorly, very fast. You know, to the point where we say, we, all we have to do is say 22 a day. And everyone knows what that means. That's how ubiquitous military suicide is. It's like MST. Like it's so ubiquitous. We have, it has its own freaking acronym. Mm -hmm. It's like, really that's that's not okay um but you know at that time i you know i was i was really not okay i was really not okay and that could have gone very badly very quickly i'm so thankful that i have a i have a loving family incredible friends wonderful support i'm really really lucky and I recognize that there are a lot of folks who aren't that lucky. It, it's hard to get help. Yeah. It, it's, and that's not okay. The book is called The Soldier's Guide to PTSD. Uh, where can people get that? Virginia? Uh, certainly you can go to the soldiers blog. Dot com mm -hmm. and uh, folks who, who sign up for our blog, we're, we're giving away a free audio book. Oh, okay. Yeah. We are, we are doing that as a giveaway for your listeners because like nobody that. becomes a trauma therapist for the money or the fame. And that's a soldiers blog.com. The soldiers blog.com. Okay, uh, you awesome. can sign up for our newsletter and we will email you um, the audio book uh, for download. Uh, that being said, you know, one thing I would want your listeners to know is it is, it is not for everyone. Um, so it is not a, you know, a clinician's guide to PTSD, it's a soldier's guide. So it's from one soldier to another. It's, it's from me to my community. So if, um, you know, some of the language is harsh, um, we talk about things in a very blunt way that is analogous to the culture. True. Um, but it, it can be a feeling herder if you're not ready for it. So that's, that's one thing I would want your listeners to know, Okay, I appreciate but they that. can, yeah, they can, they can buy the book on, you know, Barnes and Noble, Amazon, uh, you can buy it at the soldiers Okay. And what's the best way for people to get in contact with you? 
Sure, certainly through uh, our social media. So we have a TikTok, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram. Then don't worry, I don't run any of them. I have a really young, incredible group. We are just true believers and we are all in. Um, and, and that is the best way to get a hold of me or certainly through our blog, through the soldiersblog.com. Okay. Awesome. And we respond to everybody. Awesome. Well, look, Virginia, I want to thank you so much for coming on here and sharing you uh, and your story. Um, you are incredibly inspiring, and I can't wait to have you back here on this podcast. Um, but again, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for caring about what we do. It's it's an honor to All be right. here, really. Take care. You too. I want to thank you so much for listening to this podcast and I want to let you know that I am very excited about my new podcast, The Right Now Project. The Right Now Project is about healing. It's about stepping into our own courage and authenticity and getting started or continuing along our healing process. We're all going through something, whatever it is, in this crazy life we're living. And The Right Now Project is about honoring that, celebrating that, and sharing our stories via the associated membership site. Check us out at therightnowproject.com, therightnowproject.com.